Okay, so my name is Danica Kemp Avant, and I'm your SOA Director of Sustainable Equity and Inclusion. And I have the pleasure to open this evening with the land acknowledgement. And this is a very special uh, moment for me because it is Indigenous Peoples Day, and I happen to be a Indigenous person. So on behalf of my ancestors of the Narragansett, and Wampanoag Tribe, I am going to provide you with the Yale Land Acknowledgement. <coughs> Yale University acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket, Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shanikonk, Golden Hill, Pugwasset, Niantic, Quinnipiac, and the Algonquin speaking people have stewarded through generations and the lands and the waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationships that exist between these peoples and the nations of this land. On behalf of my ancestors and those that are still here with us in celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day, I want to say kaputush, which is thank you in the Wampanoag language for attending this evening. Thank you and enjoy this event. Hi everyone. Uh, again, I just want to thank you for coming. This is a kickoff of our Distinguished Lecture Series that also incorporate an Art and Activism Series as well. And this is um, our attempt to reboot um, a distinguished lecture series that used to happen at the School of Art. Um, I'm sure I've seen some of you at the architecture lectures that happen every week. We're trying to do one. I know all of us have in your various departments some amazing lectures that come every single week. And we're hoping that um, now post-COVID we can do one that incorporates the entire school um, maybe once a month or um, two or three times a semester. So thank you for coming tonight. And this event in particular is sponsored by John and Kate Carafel, who um, again, right before COVID, uh, gave um, an endowment to, to really um, foster this type of visiting artists, distinguished artists to come and speak to all of you. So, without further ado, um, I want to in, um, introduce Gregory Crutzen here, and he is going to kick us off with um, Catherine Obi. Thank you. Good evening. We're very fortunate to have Kathy with us tonight, one of my very close friends and colleagues. I'd like to thank Kim, Nika, Nicole, and Lindsay for all their support in organizing this event. There are many words that come to mind that can define Kathy. Trailblazer, activist, educator, mentor, visionary, advocate, pioneer, icon, and then finally, photographer. <laughs> Kathy has been making pictures for over 30 years that challenge, inspire, represent, and transform the medium and our view of the world. Please help me in welcoming Kathy Opie to the School of Art. Everybody. Can you hear me okay? Because yeah. I can arrange my little sweater thing. Oh, there's some things sliding down towards me. Okay, I think it's okay. It's not going to attack me. I think I'm okay. Um, okay, we're going to bring the first image up. And um, so, yeah, 30 years is about right, but I actually picked up a camera when I was nine. And I had uh, written a book report about Lewis Hine. 
And it, I lived in Sandusky, Ohio. That's where I grew up until I was 13 and I moved to California. And uh, this is my very first self-portrait. And so I'm nine years old in front of my house. Um, the word that, uh, that also Greg left out was dyke. Yeah. Definitely a baby dyke here, no doubt about it. It's as dykey as dyke you can be. Even my zipper's half down in my body. And so, you know, doing, doing pretty well in Sandusky, Ohio at the age of nine. I decided to make a very different lecture for you guys tonight. Because I have been doing lectures where, for years, I just walked everybody through the bodies of work. And I really decided that one of the greatest things about being at Yale and having once been an educator here at Yale was that I was mainly talking to practitioners. And so I wanted to create a lecture that was more about my practice and my ideas around photography than just walking you through the kind of greatest hits. So, but we're going to go through, as my assistant said, what well, Kathy, you, you have to have the greatest hits in. You can't just go into the new work. So we're going to have the greatest hits first, and then we're going to go into the, the new work. So in 1989, 1990, I made Being and Having. These were all shot with a 4 or 5 camera. Um, I wanted to photograph my friends with fake mustaches on because we would all go to the one and only lesbian bar in LA called The Palms. And we'd ride our motorcycles and we'd have fake mustaches on and we'd try to give girls rides home at night and see if they would come with us. Uh, I never was, no, it didn't work for me. Uh, Bo, that's probably because Bo, my, my, uh, my kind of uh, persona was a used aluminum side salesman from Ohio. So what kind of chance are you going to have with somebody like that, really? Um, so these are all with my friends. They have their names underneath. They're hanging up at MoMA right now, actually. MoMA finally included me in their collection. It took a long time, but they did. Uh, I still have my letter from Peter Glassy that says that he won't uh, write for me for uh, getting a job at UCLA because he didn't know my work well enough. So there's all these little moments like that where it's like, yeah, Peter Glassy. Deal with the mustaches now. <laughs> uh, this is just some of the early portraits from 1999 uh, to 95. This is Justin Bond. Miguel. Miguel was dying of AIDS when I made this image. Um, he weighed about 90 pounds. A good portion of that body of work was paying homage to my community and to my friends and those who weren't around. Uh, his image was used for his uh, memorial service as well. Um, this is Joe and Idexa. Self-portrait cutting. Uh, this is up, the print is up right now at the Leslie Lohman Museum in a show that was curated by uh, Gemma Rolls Bentley around uh, the theme of home. And uh, this, it just so happens that this photograph is actually 30 years old now. And so it, uh, it, it, it was uh, put up for the 30th anniversary, uh, for, the, for the 30th anniversary of me making this. And it's, you know, two stick figure girls holding hands. It's optimistic. The sun is coming out of the clouds. Um, but at the time, you know, somebody came up to me the other night at the, the gala and said, well, why did you make that? And it was so interesting, like, why did you make that? Like, okay, let me put on my big boy artist pants and tell you why I made it. Um, I made it because, you know, of my identity. I made it because of AIDS. I made it because of what blood meant. I made it because of identity. And using my body and kind of at this moment in time also with making the colored portraits and self-portrait cutting on my back, I was also really invested in what was the relationship of, of the camera in terms of me wanting to be a documentary photographer and stating always that I'm a social documentary photographer. What is the state of the camera in studio versus out in the world? What would it be like for me to photograph all my friends on bright colored seamlesses versus their bedrooms with the whips and the chains and everything hanging? What happens with the ephemera is left out of the image and you just are dealing with the kind of color and the relationship of, of that so that the identity then is worn on the body, so that the body becomes its site of architecture. So within all my work that in the past 30 years, it has gone in and out through traversing those kind of well-known kind of genres of, of photography, of landscape, portraiture, still life, 
um, yeah, all, uh, all of those genres. <laughs> And so this is from domestic, and then this is from um, actually a body of work I, I did called Inauguration. And these are images from the Fiden book, because the Fiden book that came out about three years ago was the first time that I ever had a really large monograph that wasn't a museum catalog monograph. And it was the first time that I ever really saw my work uh, taken out of the bodies of work. And so the images began to be placed next to each other in a certain order um, that the chapters were uh, people, places, and politics. And those are the, what my work has framed. So the idea just of, of a lesbian couple at home in Minnesota with then a newscast MSNBC booth at the inauguration. This is from San Francisco, Harry, Chloe, Flipper, and Tanya from domestic that was taken in 96. These were all shot with an 8x10 camera. And it was really important that I shot 810 because I wanted to have a conversation with Greg. I wanted to have, have a conversation with, uh, with Tina. I wanted to have a, a conversation with Sally Mann. And I wanted to really think about what is the relationship of that beast of a camera of an 810 in relationship to the domestic environment. And uh, Tina Barney was doing kind of really amazing Connecticut work in terms of the book that Scalo had just produced, Theater of Manners, had come out. And so I was really thinking again about, well, Peter Glass, he'll bring his name up again. Never have met him, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he, he had this really important exhibition that Greg was in that was a kind of a seminal exhibition for photography in the 90s. Uh, pleasure and Terror, Comfort and Domestic, I got the title wrong, but uh, there wasn't really dyke households in it. And so I really believe that by making representation, uh, you can fulfill those needs, so to speak. Miggy and Eileen, um, she is, uh, had twin girls the day after this was taken. So the only place she was comfortable was floating in the pool in L.A. Self-portrait nursing, taken in 2002. This is, Oliver is now 21. He's an art history major at Tulane, and he'll be graduating this year, which is just crazy that it's already done. This is Oliver, a little older, with a tutu. So this is from New Orleans, where I did a body of work called 1999. And the body of work 1999, I decided to go, for, I was living here in New York teaching at Yale, and I decided to go from New York to California on a road trip uh, with my girlfriend. And I was really interested in kind of the great American road trip and what photographers do on it, thinking about Frank, thinking about Walker Evans, and Delor you know, Dorothy Lane. Um, and I was uh, thinking about like a lot of signage, um, reminding everybody to silence their cell phones. Uh, <laughs> and, and one of the things that I call right now that was happening in the country is what I call the quaint fear, which was Y2K. That in 2000, we were going to lo lose all our information, that the numbers were going to roll back. And this was like a really big fear. It's like it was written about and talked about quite a bit, that we could all lose our information, and that's it. So I did this very quiet road trip where I went from uh, New York to California and I paid a very close attention to all the hand painted signs because I thought that's what we were going to go back to. So kind of the American vernacular to a certain extent. And then this is from the Redentori in, in Venice, Italy, where they celebrate the same day, the end of the plague with a huge, spectacular fire mm -hmm. show. We have Alaska. In this image, it's very hard to see. Well, oh, I did that thing that I wasn't supposed to do. I pushed the wrong button. Um, in here, there is, one of the things is, is I've always had a really kind of funny relationship with National Geographic. Like it's, you know, it was the magazine that was in my house. It was, it was what I grew up with, life and look and National Geographic, and that's how we learned how to be photographers. That's where we looked for photography. But one of the things about National Geographic is just the 
unbelievable relationship of photographer to wildlife, right? You're kind of just like, what is going on? So I kind of like making a little bit of parodies around National Geographic photographs. And you'll see that later with the swamps too, where really what is, oh, I did it again. Uh, really what is happening here is it's a pack of wolves surrounding a mother grizzly and her cubs. And so the print itself is 40-50 and all of a sudden when you go in it, you begin to see the pack, the, 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 the wolves with the grizzly bears. But otherwise it's just this idyllic landscape. And I'm really interested in playing with nature photographs in that way. And then this is high school football, where I traveled the country for three years photographing high school football in the mid-2000s. Blonde news reporter and a brunette news reporter. This is from a body of work called In and Around Home that went with 1999. There's a book called 1999 in In and Around Home. And so the quaint fear had ended. 9-11 had happened. I had moved back to California. Um, this, the reporters were reporting of 34 sex offenders living in this one house as a halfway house in our neighborhood. And the neighborhood and the community felt that 34 registered sex offenders was too much in one house. So there was a huge protest happening outside of it. But what I like is just this constant relationship of what the news is in relationship to also theater. And then how is it in terms of making a documentary photograph of it? Like what is a document of these moments that the news is constantly casting this information before us? This is Jenny Shimutsu. This is from a body of work I did, Girlfriends, where after doing high school football and being within that kind of amazing world of intense uh, young uh, adolescent masculinity, I decided to go out and photograph all my iconic butch friends. And so this is uh, from that body of work. Surfers. Uh, these are shot 810. The horizon line is always in the middle. And so I line it up so that when you have all 14 lined up, it becomes a broken panorama. I'm really interested in landscape being vertical and I'm interested in fracturing it a lot. I do a lot of fracturing of the landscape through the kind of sequencing of the images. Abstract landscape. These I made intentionally to go with the photographs of my friends, my artists on black backgrounds. I wanted a pause. I felt like we had at this point, when I started this body of work, we had been so inundated with Instagram and Facebook and what were images were doing. And so many people were asking me like, well, how can you even still be a photographer with all of this? I still get that question regularly from interviews. And, uh, and so the abstract landscape is a way for me to go around to all the national parks in America and make images, but you don't know where they're from. And it's another way of just playing with what we think is iconic, because that is a huge part of my practice, is the relationship to what is iconic, and then reframing or re-looking at that iconography. Also, an abstract landscape. Uh, this, these were done in, in uh, the 90s. This was the first body of work of American cities, and I, and I think I did four or five American cities. Uh, but it started with the mini malls in Los Angeles. And the mini malls for me, these are shot with a 7 by 17 inch banquet camera made by Keith Canham for those camera people out there. Um, so the negatives are, it's an Ilford film that makes uh, a 717 negative. And I really love panorama and I was shooting earlier panoramas of freeways but it was on a much smaller camera. And, but the mini mall for me became the site of, of the kind of mom and pop shop, the relationship of immigrant communities to Los Angeles. So that when you traverse through the city, and it's always funny because I bring New Yorkers, like especially curators, to a mini mall for a really good sushi restaurant. And they're like, oh, we're at a mini mall. And I'm like, yeah, you're going to have the best sushi, you know. <laughs> and, but one of the things that I love it is like when you get out to the malls, it's the Jamba Juices and it's the Noah Bagels and it's the Starbucks. But these are real signifiers of, of LA. 
When I lived in New York, I made a body of work on Wall Street. This was two weeks before 9-11 happened. This is the bottom of the trade towers. It was just Sunday morning. I would go out early. On all, the, all American cities were me hitting every Sunday before people got up and went out and just getting that dawn light. This is Chicago. That wasn't, uh, the, the, each American city is about the specificity of identity of place. So in the way, same way my body would be a, a site of a queer body. Um, Chicago's specificity of identity was the relationship of how they lit the architecture at night. Um, New York was Wall Street. And so much of that was because of Bernice Abbott in relationship to her verticality. Like, what do we do with the verticality? Um, and then this is the four seasons of Lake Michigan. So this was the beginning of when I started putting pauses in with the black and whites, that I realized that I wanted a pause of a landscape with these various black and white series. This is on a container ship where I went from the port of Busan in Korea to the port of Long Beach. Um, I photographed every sunrise and every sunset, whether or not it happened on the ship. So it's another way of playing with what is iconic or cliche. Is like sunrises and sunsets are about the biggest cliche you can do photographically. But the relationship of what happens to sky and water and whether or not it's a foggy day all gets just, it ends up being just about bearing witness and not the cliche of the sunrise and sunset. Oliver and Mrs. Nibbles. So this is the Portraits on Black, which started with family members, friends, and artists. And it was a way to go back to portraiture. I had really missed it a lot. I hadn't done, I had done high school football portraits outside, but I hadn't done formal studio portraits in a while. And I saw two exhibitions in London. Uh, one was a Da Vinci exhibition at the National Gallery, and the other was, um, was, um, oh God, don't you hate that? This is called Middle Aged, everybody. Uh, it'll come to me, but oh, no, it'll get, it'll, I'll get there. But anyway, uh, these two exhibitions made me really think about the relationship of form, the formal portrait, and that even though Holbein was the earlier kind of ruse for the first set of portraits, I was really thinking about the black background in relationship to my own age and my own menopause and what the void is, what's the relationship of the void at this point. And so it was, uh, it was uh, Gerhard Richter who had the show at the Tate's. See, I told you it'd come to me. <laughs> and one of the things that happened was his abstract paintings were placed next to the portraits for the first time. And that's why I brought in the abstract landscape was that relationship of the pause to what I was experiencing with thinking about Richter. This is Lawrence, dear Lawrence, who's no longer with us. So with the portraits, you'll know that some look, some look off, they all look at each other. They, it's really important to sequence work that way. You can't enter a room where every single person is staring at you. It's a little off-putting. Um, even though I like to stare at people, I think that, you know, it's really great to enter this work from different places where you can have these private moments as well with the work. Another abstract. David and Thelma. All of them are also the first name. It was important for me not to have it be about kind of celebrity culture always the most, most, mostly that's only first names when I make portraits. Ron. The ovals were really just one of these things where you go, okay, well, I make a lot of rectangles, <laughs> and I make some squares here and there, you know? And then it's like I started making cameos, and I started thinking about cameos, and I started thinking about miniature portraits that, that I just love so much. I love any kind of miniature. You put a miniature in 
an old museum for me, and I'm just staring at it forever. And uh, so the oval became a way of dealing with portraiture as well, and just thinking about just that history. But they're oversized, so they become like oversized cameos in a certain way. Rick? Betty? Okay. So we've gone through the past, now we're coming to the present. So the last seven years, I have been really questioning what the heck is photography doing for me? Like what is this medium I'm involved in? How do I think about it? What is my relationship to it? Everybody's asking me this all the time. You know, I love making pictures. I never stop making photographs. I, at this point, I think my, can't, my phone in my pocket alone has something like, you know, 180,000 pictures on it. It's ridiculous. Uh, it's a problem. <laughs> and so with problems of liking to make so many pictures, you have to question your picture taking and your picture method, right? You're kind of like, okay, well, I make a lot of pictures. What am I thinking about? So with all these years of traversing back and forth from portraiture to the city and to architecture and identity, I wanted to have a conversation with a very important piece that was made in 1962. I was born in 1961, and it's Chris Marker's La Jete. And La Jete is a piece that is, um, so my, my piece in 2017 in conversation with La Jete is titled The Modernist. And The Modernist, um, I'm going to just explain a little bit because you won't be able to see the whole piece here. In the same way that Marker's film is, um, is completely all stills, mine is all stills as well. It runs for 28 minutes. The protagonist is a longtime friend of mine, Pigpen, who I photographed for years. Um, so the, uh, uh, their trans body and relationship to modernism and a utopic dream. So how many people have seen La Jete here? Okay, a number of people. For those who did see La Jete, La Jete is also is, is a dystopic piece in relationship to nuclear war. So it's as if nuclear war has, has you know, happened and, and it's a dream state that goes back and forth from this dream state to science. And there's one moment in it where it's live film where the eyes open and it's like a moment of break. But he has, uh, Chris has sound all the way through his piece. My piece has no sound and, uh, well, one sound, uh, only one sound but no movement. So instead of having eyes open or something like that, which would have been too predictable to have that move in conversation with Chris, mine in the middle of the film is a really loud match strike. And then it goes into a sequence of activation. So what, what you're seeing here is the installation at Regan Projects. And this is a theater that's built in the middle of the gallery by the architect Michael Molson. And so you would enter that theater to see the piece the piece outside is the collage that the protagonist is making while I'm making while I'm creating the film. So that is that is titled Stasha's piece, Big Pen's piece, uh, but it's the collage that was made in the studio that I rephotographed to scale, so it would be one to one scale. And then around the gallery, what you have is instead of uh, horizontals, you're back to vertical portraits because I wanted the portrait still to be the important aspect of what you saw within the exhibition. So you enter here up this ramp. It's kind of made like a modernist house. It also reflects because most modernist houses are glass and reflect. And so here's some of the images reflected. And then you would sit in the theater and you would, this is just a short of it. And so this to give you an idea of what the movement looks like.
the timing is not consistent. There's moments where it speeds up. There's moments when it slows down throughout the piece. And so basically the story is about this protagonist who decides for their art that they were going to burn down all the, modern, uh, all the kind of iconic modernist houses of L.A. <laughs> and they were going to then make work about burning those houses down. And this was before Parasite came out, so then I felt like I had something right on the nose with Parasite when that came out. I was like, yeah, okay. Um, and, and so the character, first house the character burns down is uh, Larry Gagosian's house in LA. <laughs> and, then it, and then it goes, it goes from there and to where it's the chemisphere and the Sheets Goldstein and, and you know, the hilltop house. Like all the really iconic houses uh, get burned down. No modernist house was harmed in the making of this film. <laughs> It upset people greatly because, it, you know, this year California is green. We look out now and we have actually green hills was just shocking. Like, we haven't seen green hills in, ever in October in my lifetime. I've been in California since 1974 except for my, what I call my blink at Yale. Um, and uh, so the character just goes through methodically, and the character lives in what was my 500-foot square studio behind my house in West Adams. So I had a little 500-square-foot studio, and it was the last piece that I made in my West Adams house. And, uh, and they sleep in one room, and all, all their belongings are around them, and they make their art in that one room, and they sleep on a couch. And so this photograph would show up a lot as a obviously a horizontal because it was a dream sequence and throughout the piece in the same way of La Jete, you kept wondering whether or not this was a dream or if this was real. And so there's Piggy just working on work and these were all around the gallery then. Pigpen ended up getting a bigger gas tank through it because it felt like that gas tank wasn't butch enough, and I felt really bad. I said, oh yeah, sorry, let's, let's go to the hardware store. You pick the one you want. Big, huge red metal one. And I was like, okay, well, that's going to be heavier to carry, but then Pigpen reminded me that we didn't have to fill it. And I, said, <laughs> and I said, but I do think we have to fill it. We have to see the strain in the body, right? Isn't that what filmmakers do? <laughs> So it, it was really amazing. This moment here at the window is in the film where the match strike happens and the whole audience just jumps. And then all of a sudden the film, the, the piece becomes activated where Pigpen is throwing the gas out of the gas tank onto the chemisphere and then lights a match and then you see the fire happen. And, I was trying to do Google fires like off of the internet and I kept like trying to <clears throat> recreate the fires within my pictures and doing that and I couldn't like there were just they were all they weren't right. So in my old house in West Adams I started building various kinds of fires in the back that I then photographed that I added into the film then because then I could put fans on it and get the it was all right then. But it was really hard and it drove my assistant crazy because I have one fantastic assistant, Heather, for the last 10 years. And she was like, well, aren't you gonna storyboard it? And I said, no, it, it lives in my head. <laughs> and she's like, but don't you need to storyboard it so you need to know what to do with, with Pigpen when you get to location? I'd be like, no, I, I'm just gonna direct Pigpen and it's just going to come out that way. And so I don't know if I'd actually make it in Hollywood at all, because I'm obviously somebody who doesn't storyboard or script or anything. Um, but it was a really amazing experience and allowed me to move through my images in a really different way. And that was one of the things that I was trying to do, is what am I going to do with all these images that I make? And so I was able to create a form that allowed me to think about it that led to then other forms. Just some of the black and white photographs. Yeah. 
Also, I think it's really important to say that a lot of people ask me in lectures if Pigpen or IDEXA are my muses because they show up so much in my work. I don't believe in muses. I don't have muses. I have friends. Rhetorical landscapes come next. So I was thinking again about the history of collage. I was thinking about our, our cell phones that we carry around in our pockets. I was thinking about the word rhetorical landscape. I was thinking about rhetorical in relationship to swamps and Donald Trump. I was really, you know, very aware of this idea of drain the swamp over and over again, even though they're the most precious, most important ecosystems around, and we need them, and they will disappear. They will be gone. Um, so you come into the installation at Regan, and it's these monitors I ordered on Amazon. Thank you, uh, Jeff Bezo, I guess. <laughs> and they were the best ones I could find. I tried to find them in other places. But these actually look to me more like the first version of the iPhone with the chrome around, that rounded edges. And so each one of these uh, monitors house a political collage. The political collages were done thinking about growing up with Monty Python Flying Circus and what also is going to happen with all our different media devices, right? I mean, we're not going to have magazines to cut out one day. The act of collage will disappear at some point. There is like all these different ways in which I'm trying to merge older technology with newer technology with what is happening to imagery in our time and how we, you know, myself have grown up flipping a page of a magazine. The other day I was at a doctor's office and a two-year-old went like this to the picture on the magazine. And I was like, oh, oh, God help us all. <laughs> so these monitors each housed a collage. I will, you will see three of the collages. There is no sound in the collages. And then around it are photographs that I took in the swamps in Florida, Georgia, and Louisiana. Um, I especially fell in love with the Okefenokee because it's really fun to say too, right? <laughs> um, the swamps are shot all, uh, you know, with a with with a digital camera. But I wanted that quietness again, that pause in relationship to the activism so that the collage is where the activism is, and then you can go back into the landscape and you can have that pause. And I think we need that more and more these days. Oh, by the way, if anybody out there has family members in either Israel or, or Palestine, I'm thinking of all of you as this crisis is emerging in the past couple of days. These are also my attempt to be a National Geographic photographer, <laughs> but they're amateur. That they're really amateur, and I'll tell you why they're amateur, and I kind of really like the moments that they become incredibly amateur National Geographic landscape photographs. This one could pass, possibly. Maybe this one as well, but not quite. This one definitely, National Geographic would never print. <laughs> the depth of field in it is all wrong. <laughs> Same with this one, they would never do it. This one is one of my favorites because it's the most confusing because the reflection is actually more in focus than the actual landscape. And so this is where like all these different moments within the print kind of pixelization happens as well or you think it's happening but it's not. And it's just the matter of what water and light and sky are doing. It's not snow. Swamps bog up.
all done through stop, uh, stop motion animation, copy stand, paper, tons of little cutout guns. Um, I, I'm now considered a Republican because I, I, I subscribe to all these magazines to get these images from. <laughs> so now I get like all this mail from Republicans all the time asking me to support their causes. Um, so I ordered from a cross section of American magazines. Uh, I probably subscribed to for three years about, oh, I don't know, maybe 22 magazines. And then I would rip and tear and cut for two years. And then I would start putting these collages together. Each of the backgrounds you'll notice will be different. They're all gridded, blue grid, so I'm thinking very much about the Bauhaus movement in relationship to political art here. But instead of using the already architectural grid, I decided to paint my own grid because within this, it, returning to a screen, I wanted the hand to be present in it. And so by hand painting the, the lines in the grid, it allowed me to do that. And so you'll see some are finished, some aren't, some are more precise. That one was about guns. This one is about white supremacy. Yeah. We got a lot of troubles, you guys, ahead. This country is going to be really hard. They really, we, artists are going to be really needed, but as well as activists. And you have to be more than an artist right now as well. You really do. I, now that I've retired from UCLA, I'm volunteering in elementary schools for literacy. Um, I will be working with Crenshaw High and other students in relationship to college application time. Um, so I'll use my, my time besides making images as an educator now to uh, support, uh, you know, early education. I did the college thing for 32 years. So I'm ready to go back to kindergarten. <laughs> I want to capture them. So when I'm making these with, with in, in the studio, I worked with an animator who had graduated from CalArts, uh, who did most of the stop motion for me. But I would sit and I would narrate. So I would build the whole collage on the sheet of paper. Then I would take it apart. And then I would narrate all the movement and what I wanted to come back onto the sheet of paper. And you know, there's humor in here like Monty Python. It's very upsetting and intense the collages are to a certain extent but you know when the baseball goes bouncing around and the soccer team comes out and wave their hands that's the little bit of the terry gillum stuff in terms of monty python where you understand that there's sarcasm within this too and i'm not really known as being satirical as an artist so it's interesting for me to actually bring humor and sarcasm in because i personally think in my personal life i have a good sense of humor but my sense of humor actually doesn't show up in my work very often. Very rarely, actually. And we have the rising sea waters. So you can see how this grid is painted a little differently as well. And this is just about what's going to be happening to our planet. I think photography still can be a single image. I really do. I hang on to that. But I would say that I've, I've been in, in challenging that aspect for myself and questioning it. So the architecture is also rising out of the sea. The little girl, you can't read it as this, but if you actually are a magazine person who looks at ads a lot, some of this becomes out of memory. But she was actually underwater as a ballerina. So it was a really odd moment, though I just kept her in the water. And then this last one for you. Oh, no, that was the last one. Okay. <laughs> 
Moving on, 2020. A lot went on in 2020. Um, pandemic, and also incredible um, amount of um, social activism in our streets in relationship to George Floyd. Thinking about the bodies of work that I showed you briefly, 1999 and in and around home, I decided it was time to buy an RV again and go back out on the road. And I did that with Domestic too, where I bought an RV and I spent three and a half months on the road photographing. And um, so 2020, um, didn't, I knew, I had a loose idea in mind that I was going to explore the, the, the monuments that remained and the monuments that were removed throughout uh, the United States landscape, um, going all throughout the South. It was also my son's first year in college at Tulane, and he was actually in person because it was in Louisiana. And so we, that was the other thing is my wife and I needed to figure out how to get our kid to, uh, to New Orleans. And both of us were a little nervous about flying and we didn't know what to do. And, and uh, I, can't, you know, Julie came home and I said, I bought an RV. And she said, you did what? And I said, yeah, we're going on the road. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, oh shit. And she goes, did you really? Or are you kidding me? Because I always kid like that. And she's like, I know I really did. And, uh, so this was the first piece that I made before I edited the diptychs together. And this uh, piece is a poem titled, All Lowercase Monument Slash Monumental. And what you have is you have um, abstract landscapes like I've made throughout uh, the country in, in, in national parks and so forth. But I wanted to make it more of a, of a poem in which the Robert E. Lee from Richmond, Virginia, that became an activist site, uh, was in focus in the middle of it. And so the question within the, the photographs of the landscapes is you'll notice, notice that they all have water in them. So what is our relationship to water, the earth, to rebirth, to the idea of regeneration? but also whose land is this? How can we even begin to claim this land? And so this poem was beginning to do that in different ways. Uh, you'll see in the beginning photograph, it is a sunset, and the end photograph is a sunset. These bookends are really important to the piece because the sun isn't setting. I've just moved the camera. It's the exact same framing at the exact same time, but the camera has moved making you think that you're looking at a setting sun, but it's just a repositioning in the same way that we reposition our language in relationship to the politics that engage us in all of these fucked up ways. And the, you'll notice that with the water, the falls is also the duality, the, the constant kind of relationship between what's happening and the dichotomy of our lives politically. Um, I grew up uh, in Ohio with a Republican dad who owned the largest political campaign collection in American history. That's all housed in the Smithsonian now. So I grew up with the original Lincoln Ferry types on my table. I grew up with the uh, Truman defeats of uh, 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 Dewey, uh, po Dewey defeats Truman over the, you know, it was Truman's paper that I had on the wall. I grew up with all of this ephemera around me that has informed much of my identity and my work as, as a political artist. My father voted for Obama at the end of his life after me just like challenging him nonstop. Um, he said, I can't believe I sent you to art school and you wear black and you're a Marxist now. How can this be? You know, it was like his worst nightmare. He made me get my real estate license before I went to art school so that I would have something to fall back on. I never sold a house. Um, so this poem started the body of work of then the diptychs. And so this is just each of the individual photographs of Monument Monumental. This is no longer in Richmond as well, and a good part of my practice and when I talk about documentary photography, it's in relationship to the idea of bearing witness. So I've moved away from being a social documentary to somebody who really describes myself as somebody who wants to bear witness to be thinking about 
what are the important aspects that I want to talk about and the questions that I want to answer in, in, in relationship to the life that I'm living? And what is my relationship to representation around that? And those, I would say that when I started high school football, I never used the term bearing witness until then because I realized that um, I had just, to tell you the truth how high school football started, you guys, was my wife is from a Catholic family in Church Point, Louisiana, and I had to go home every summer for two and a half weeks. And I had, a, I had 25 nieces and nephews, and all those nephews played football. And so, but then what happened was when I was taking those photographs, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan were in full blast, and so many of these kids were going off to be soldiers. And I realized I was bearing witness to a vulnerable generation that would have beaten me up in high school as a dyke, but that actually I needed to have an enormous amount of empathy for the, even this kind of masculinity, that it wasn't just performed masculinity, that there was unbelievable vulnerability. And I do believe that all portraits should be humanely done. I'm very much a humanist as a, as a person, and really I, I have no desire at all, even if it's a football player, because they did on the sidelines, they were yelling like, you know, to other players, like, you look like a fag, and I'd just be like, we don't need to say those words. <laughs> so, um, so the bearing witness came out of that. And so it all started in LA, this is in order, um, in which that at first they were gonna be single photographs and I realized a single photograph couldn't hold this moment. Nor did I want it to be a single photograph because what is my authorship in relationship to the time that we're living in? How do we begin to even think about authorship? So it starts out with the Black Lives Matter protest in, uh, in LA in which the police surrounded us and shot upon us that day um, to the map then in the RV where I started marking my pathway to monuments. And it's really funny because somebody said, are you trying to do blue and red states, Kathy? What are the blue ones about? And I just had ran, run out of red stick at things. So <laughs> I pulled out the blue. It was nothing specific about them. But that was a question. So roots, this is in the Ozarks. Each place is, I don't have the list here, but each place is, is cataloged where the images were made. So this is in uh, Tennessee in which they shrouded their monuments. They didn't remove them, but they shrouded them. And then below is, is, uh, is from the Richmond, Virginia. Around, around the Robert E. Lee in Richmond, Virginia, they had a, a sign for every person who had been killed by um, an officer. This was uh, Stonewall Jackson in Richmond, Virginia, which had been removed, but the plinth still stood. And it was interesting what plinths got removed and what plinths stood. And then this happens to be in Georgia above it, where a woman came out for her Marlboro break. And uh, she was showing me that that little bit of grass was where that monument stood. So in Georgia, they really went all the way down and replaced the grass. They didn't leave the plinths for the most part, at least here, they did it. Also social media, I really wanted to talk about the influence of social media and that we all do screenshots off of our phones now of everything and that a screenshot is also a photograph. And so this is a screenshot right, you know, just as the process started in Richmond. And then, of course, the debate where the fly lands on Pence's head, which just was the weirdest kind of odd moment that it all became about not what Pence was saying about, but the stupid fucking fly. So Brianna Taylor with a family who uh, all day long when I, I was there for a while, really, really bearing witness for about two days in Richmond making photographs. And I was there with cameras and so family members would come up to me and ask if I would do a portrait of them for, for, for them with their phones. And so people with, with, who saw me with my bigger cameras would always ask if I would take their family portraits, which I always paused and did because it was such an important moment for families gathering together here in protest. And this family, I asked if I could, um, I could uh, use their portrait for the body of work. 
but a lot of these diptychs are in relationship to one another formally, so that the ring of flowers in relationship to the graffiti, but more importantly, her face in relationship to this face. This is Portland, Oregon mural. I went up to Portland too, and that's George Floyd's eye. And then just a neighborhood through the south. This is just LA Times News with a sea ranch party, which somebody was serving me goldfish in a gloved hand because of the pandemic, and it was just too weird not to add. <laughs> because I also, you know, during this time, there was also a pandemic, so I wanted it to encompass all of what was happening. Again, the kind of division of our country, Confederate flag in the back of the RV in Texas. The amazing monument to the lives of lynching victims throughout the South in this monument. And then this is from a park in New Orleans in which it says, uh, commissioned uh, by Klansmen. So again, that conversation of, of that representation of these bodies then over this existing monument still. Uh, this body of work hasn't been shown yet. Um, some deem it too political. That's okay, that's why we make work. Some of it shows, some of it doesn't. Uh, the kudzu in the South is as evasive as racism. It just won't stop, it just continues, it evades, it goes everywhere. Duke University, this chapel had a Confederate monument inside that was uh, decommissioned, it was taken out. Um, but when I got there, there was an amazing woman with her daughter with a photographer being photographed for her achievements. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I watched the Republican National Convention on my iPad in the RV and the, it's the Daughters of the Confederacy, that is their headquarters. And one of the things that have never been written about, which is really upsetting for me, is Kahindi's uh, sculpture, Rumor of War, is actually blazing towards the Daughters of the Confederacy outside the museum, that's its location. And nobody has ever discussed the relationship to the placement of that mounted uh, uh, you know, rumor of war piece uh, uh, in relationship to the, the Daughters of the Confederacy Home Museum. So diptychs are supposed to talk to each other. We're supposed to talk to each other. Uh, Robert E. Lee High School, where they removed Robert E. Lee. This is, this is a, and then this is a football game because I couldn't resist. <laughs> This is from Abraham Lincoln's boyhood home of his outdoor, of his museum of the relief, and then uh, pairing it with the ass of the Robert E. Lee. This is, uh, again, a sunset, uh, kind of the open road photograph that every photographer takes on every road trip. <laughs> but then this is a very well, bizarrely preserved Confederate monument be behind somebody's personal home. This is a country club that I went to in Poway, California as a kid that's become a really messed up uh, site for bored white children in suburbia in Southern California. And then with it, yet another monument in Richmond. How did we get that red dot up there? Did I do something? Oh, it went away. <laughs> <laughs> And then this is how the body of work ends. It ends with um, cobwebs. And then there, this is actually a true monument of, that people are trying to ascend, hikers are trying to ascend. So it's like the webs that were caught in with the idea of possibly actually seeing an end to this one day. Maybe, maybe not. I, I would hope so, but you know, it's not looking too good. So that is the body of work 2020. Um, the next body of work is an exhibition I opened last week in Naples, so I'm going to bring you right to the gallery in Naples because it's a really, it's a very specifically installed show 
in relationship to the architecture of the space. I wanted the work to go to uh, Naples first. It was work that I made at the American, American Academy in Rome. It is um, on the Vatican. Uh, the body of work, Walls, Windows, and Blood, is actually what is in the body of work, uh, where I photographed all of the exterior walls of the Vatican in relationship to the points. And then in the gallery are these incredible columns. <coughs> And then I had marble plinths designed because the walls don't have a right to be hung or stand anymore. Walls should be precarious, they should lean. So again, thinking about the structure of the image in relationship to its sculpture, but also what, what is my response to these walls? How do I activate the walls? Here's more of the walls. These were shot with a Hasselblad X-Pan, so they're 35 millimeter film. And when you get into the, the prints are over six feet tall. And so the grain in them are like old school, like, you know, 70s photography grain, maybe even 60s. <laughs> Greg's laughing. I mean, the grain's really pretty, you guys. <laughs> So the gallery is uh, actually uh, was, uh, was an estate at one point that then was a consulate and now it's a gallery and it's uh, run by Thomas Dane who has a gallery in, in uh, London. And uh, all of it just worked really well and this room here with that grid back there, uh, it became like a confessional for me. Um, the other question I've gotten a lot is are you Catholic? No. I was actually raised in Ohio as an atheist in 1961, which is really rare. Um, I, I'm a spiritual person, but I, I don't know if I'm, I believe in, in, in or, or, you know, organized religion, really. Um, so the, uh, the confessional then houses the one image of the Pope, and this piece is titled No Apology. And you'll see him, he's, he comes out in his little window in St. Peter's Square. And um, the no apology and why it's titled that way is that happened to be the very day that the Pope first acknowledged through his little window the indigenous children of Canada and their bodies that were just found. But he did not apologize for it. Later he went on a tour and apologized, but he did not apologize for it through his little window. He mentioned them, the children, but that was it. So across from that is then a blood grid. So I photographed every single window in the Vatican Museum looking out. I photographed every representation of blood within the art of the Vatican. And then I photographed the entire wall expanse. But I also made an enormous amount of other photographs in six weeks. But the whole body of work got distilled to my own holy trinity, which is walls, windows, and blood. The windows all are very framed windows just looking out. The other thing that was really interesting for me to talk about the Vatican besides the hypocrisy of the Catholic Church was the, the, um, the relationship of window and transparency and that it's a city within a city of its own governance but it looks out to another governed city. And so I'm really interested in those kind of layers of architecture and what they begin to mean with the simplicity of, again, just taking very simple images of them. So this, I'll finish up with the installations, then we'll get into being able to look at the work. So the grids over the fireplaces, like you just couldn't ask for a better place to kind of begin this installation, like to have it. This is the self-portrait in the body of work. You'll notice that I'm here in the window with the arm coming down. Um, there's in the, in the Elizabeth Taylor body of work, 700 memes, I show up in, in the Warhol. So there's always different moments that I use my reflection to remind people that I am the author of this work. Okay, enough installation shots. It was really pretty. <laughs> okay, here, I, I just ended up putting these together because it was easier than going through each one. 
One of the things are that the walls are also cameras. They're apparatuses because each one has a camera in itself watching you. So there's like this really interesting relationship where the walls become apparatuses themselves, cameras. It was a way to think about American cities and how I've been using panorama, but then just turning it. So there's 14 walls, 20 windows, and four blood grids. I love the lens flare and these different moments that happen. These are the plants that were made, designed by the architect who won the Rome Prize that year, Kati Barkin. And then here we go to the windows. So you'll notice that, that you know there's little holes for air conditioning units, and there's just one of these things where all of these details happen in these that you know, is one of the things that I love about photography so much is that I always love every single pimple, every little piece of hair coming out of a mole, like every bit, I want to read like every bit of surface. And also most people who go through the Vatican Museum are not thinking about the windows or looking out the windows, they're looking at all the treasures within the museum. But this also happened to be, I was able to have access like this where there weren't very many people because it was the pandemic still. So I didn't get like herded through the Vatican like everybody else. It was, there was, I would go four days a week, uh, about six hours a day with three cameras on me. And I was often um, like in the Sistine Chapel completely by myself, laying on the floor, staring up at it. Um, so I was able to have lots of room around me to make the body of work. It was very easy. There's rumor that I, I'm powerful enough that I was able to empty out the Vatican, but this is a false rumor. <laughs> I am not powerful enough to empty out the Vatican. The blinds are really incredible too. So this is a moment in which the, the city merges so that from here, then what I love about these photographs also is the, the city reflects on itself within the window inside the museum. So all of a sudden these spaces are merged together for a moment politically. This is my most photographic one. Meaning like I'm gonna geek out with you guys on this one because what does the bottom remind anybody of? What does that remind people of? Radiator. Hmm? Well, yeah, it is a radiator. You you named it, but it was supposed to be some tricky photo question for people, like a film clip mark. Remember film clip marks on negatives, you guys? That's my geeking out photography wise. <laughs> So it's like just the way that the shadows and that radiator ends up looking like a film clip just drove me crazy, what can I say? I don't know, weird. I was really surprised that guards would move for me. Like I would say, you know, because they'd be sitting in front of the window and I'd be like, huh, that guard's been at that window for the last four days. Is he ever gonna leave that window? Will I ever get that window by itself? It's kind of like how I photographed American cities too, where it was really important for me that it was empty. And, uh, but they eventually left. Or they would move for me. So this is a moment where it's inside the courtyard and then you're out in the city again. It's kind of 
I mean, it's good seeing them on the screen, but it's work that all my work is not, it's, it's meant for installations. Like my work is meant to go and be with in person. You can get an idea of it, but even I'm a little bored. <laughs> so I can imagine like I'll go a little faster. <laughs> But there are these moments where the gauze, like when you're looking at the print, the gauze has been like rained on and it's all, it's just, it has all of this skin to it that I would find on a person within the architecture. And then the blood grids. And so the blood grids are organized completely by me aesthetically, but they are, uh, we do have a master list of where all of the, what, who, who made all the paintings and all the work. Um, but it was, you know, really in relationship to how I've used blood in my own work, the idea of what blood is, the idea of the, this kind of sacrifice, and, and also it's, it's been interesting. I've had a number of interviews on this, this body of work, and um, often I'm fighting with museums about putting trigger warnings in front of my work because I don't want trigger warnings in front of my work, because I don't think my work is that triggering, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it is, and I don't know it. Uh, but I just think that it's interesting. You can walk through the entire Vatican Museum and see children being stabbed with, with knives and representations, and, and that there doesn't have to be trigger warnings for Catholic churches or other places, but that I have to have, my queer body has to have a trigger warning about. So from tapestry to painting, and the really interesting thing when you get into this too and you look at all of this for a while is the painters had a really good time with the blood because that's where their moment of abstraction comes in, right? They're like, oh, thank God, like, well, nah, there's my brush move here, and you just like, you feel it, like you feel the painter being released, you know, in, in those moments. And then this one is mainly tapestry. And this this is a true connection that in the it's broken up and fragmented here, but this would be going into that. This is the only place that I lined up things in a narrative way with, within the piece. Otherwise, it's, it doesn't have necessarily a narrative to, to it. And I thank you for coming, and now we're going to go into questions, and you guys can ask me anything.